dollar. And as always, thank you for all your support, including sharing, chatting, liking, and subscribing. Now roll that famous logo animation. Good evening and welcome to an extra special episode of Computer Ass Start Live. Extra special because this is an extra stream this week. Because I have some work that needs to be done if I am going to take the some computers to work at the end of the week. Yes, uh, thank you, Sean. I accidentally muted the wrong audio channel. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, my countdown uh, had no music. And we're just going to roll with that because I don't feel like re-rolling the intro on account of my mistake. All right, who do we have? We have Thomas Armstrong, Jack68K, Geek with Social Skills, Joe's Computer Museum, Branca's Creations, Electronic Mess, Everything is Broken Garage, Frank S, Trina's Technobabble, David Starbuck, Sloppy Malibu, One Bit Fever Dreams, And got lots of chat here. And Adam McGee. And I'm hoping, ah, Retro Tech Chris. Starbuck Tech, Eric Sedge, welcome. I hope I didn't miss anyone. If I did, well, you can just uh, chime in on the chat. And I will say hello. All right. So basically, Tonight, I'm working on the TRS-80 Model 4P. Hey, Jeremy, welcome. So, tonight's just the TRS-80 Model 4P. I'm, I need to get the, um, an upgrade I tried to do. I need to redo it. Oh, uh, thank you, Ryan. Yes, just uh, please don't... Uh, as I'm going to request, I don't mind birthday wishes, just no specifying which day it is if you happen to know. So, thank you. But yes, it, uh, it is about to be my birthday. Uh, Slappy Malibu, I was not at Tandy Assembly, however, I was a sponsor. So you probably did see me in a way, because I was one of the sponsors. <laughs> Yeah, um, actually, I think my Model 4P Atom is fairly clean inside. So, anyways, so what is on my workbench? Oh, thank you, Sean. Happy unbirthday, yes. Yes, very merry unbirthday to me. So, what do I have? ha. <laughs> All right, so I have a GoTech that's not in an envelope. And I have a GoTech that was in an envelope. <laughs> and I have a package of LEDs. So basically, this is what I need to do. So unfortunately, I don't, I didn't have a, like a video clip I could show really easily, but I attempted to do a GoTech mod on my TRS-80 Model 4P. So I had, these are not the two GoTechs that I used. They're actually sitting over with the rest of the TRS-80 Model 4P parts. So I bought two GoTex from Retro Friends. I think that's eBay seller John Five. They were the GoTex based on the artery. Uh, actually, hold on just a second. Let me let me actually go pull up the Flash Floppy Wiki so I can quote the correct information. 
And I will, uh, Adam, in advance, I, uh, some of this I didn't know when you were doing your TRS-80, so I couldn't have warned you about it then. Um, in fact, I think when we bought our Gotex, I'm not sure anyone had the, the new Gotex in stock for, to even know that there could have been a potential issue. So, I will preface this. Uh, there, there were, have been three editions of Gotex plus or minus, at least the ones that are the, the three and a half inch display type. And I'm not counting the variations where they, they have the, the seven segment LED numbers and they do or don't have the dial or whatnot. I'm more referring to the, the hardware inside the GoTech. But there are, yeah, I'll, I'll get to that in a, in a moment, Ryan. So just hold on one moment. So uh, the original GoTex had an STM 32F105 microcontroller. That microcontroller ran at 72 megahertz and had 64K of SRAM. So uh, according to the Flash Floppy Wiki, that one was, that one had enough RAM in it to do reliable emulation of most disk types, including the HFE disk images, which are the ones you have to use for the TRS-80. However, due to parts shortages, those have not really been available since about 2021. So GoTech redesigned their board to use a different microcontroller, and that would be the initially the Artery AT32F415. So unfortunately, the disadvantage of that microcontroller is it only had 32K of SRAM. And apparently that little amount of SRAM causes problems with two disk formats in particular. The first one being Amiga ADF disk images. And that is because Amigas, Amigas were ahead of their time in some ways. And in some ways, maybe they were ahead of even what was necessary. So normally on a floppy drive, the, the, you've got tracks and each track's divided to sectors and the computer writes a sector at a time. So there's a gap between each sector because you can't, I mean, you can't write a sector and not have a gap just due to the way things work. I mean, maybe you could, but it's incredibly difficult. So to keep costs down, there's a gap between sectors. So Commodore, in their infinite wisdom, said, you know, if we get rid of that inter-sector gap, we can fit more on a floppy disk. So on Amigas, instead of writing a sector at a time, you have to write the entire track at a time. However, that means you get to store more information on the disk because now instead of there being a gap between each sector, there's only one gap per track and that, <laughs> yeah. So anyways, unfortunately 32K of SRAM isn't really enough to reliably do an ADF disk image because that's not really enough SRAM to fit an entire track into memory because on the common, on the Amiga, you have to, every disc read and write is a track at a time. Even though there are still sectors, there's just no gap between them. So you have to read or write a s entire track at a time. Yay, Commodore. However, the other image that 32K of SRAM has trouble with is the HFE disc format because that disc format I don't know exactly what's different about it, but for a 180K disk image, the HFE file is about, about 1,000K. It's like 976K. It stores way more information. I think it actually might even store like the transitions instead of just the actual bits that would be on the disk. So anyways, 32K of SRAM isn't enough to hold a track's worth of data for HFE files. So you run into problems with the uh, Artery AT32F415 
when you're trying to do operations that would involve an entire track at a time, such as formatting a disk image. Uh, I think the HFE files, it, the, that particular one's fine with reading them because it, it's okay if it, like, I guess it's okay because your reading would be a sector at a time, so it's, that's not an operation where it's got to potentially be able to store the entire track at once, but if you're formatting a disk, I mean, it's writing every sector consecutively, so it has to be able to put the, if you don't have a fast enough, I think the deal is if you don't have a fast enough USB drive to let it flush the track out as the format's running, you can run into problems. So, so anyways, for TRS-80 Model 4P and I think the other TRS-80s, you have to use the HFV disk format because Flash Floppy doesn't support the TRS-80 disk image format. Ah, I will get to that in a moment, Adam, and I, I mostly know. Um, it, it's, I, I think I can tell you the way to tell. Um, but I'll get to that in a moment because I got to open one of these up. But I think you can tell by um, this here, and I'll zoom into it in a moment. So apparently starting in July of 2022, uh, the GoTech company started offering another GoTech that has the AT32F435 microcontroller. And now that microcontroller is pretty souped up. So it actually runs at 288 megahertz and it has 384K of SRAM. So that is enough SRAM to do any of the disk formats reliably, no question. So if you're do using Amiga or TRS-80 disk, you really want the 32F435. And I kind of wish I'd known that before I bought GoTex, but I don't think any of the vendors on eBay were selling the the 435 based one uh when when i bought gotex the first time around so anyways so how do you tell which one you have i think the way to tell and let's see if i can zoom in far enough i think the way to tell is your board is going to have under where it says gotex system it's going to say SFRKC30.AT4.35. So I think that 4.35 is referring to the microcontroller. If you've got that, and I think the other way to tell is there's actually a, uh, a uh, jumper position that's denoted on the silk screen that goes across. I think it goes across these two pins. So that's how to know you have the, four, uh, the 435 version and not the 415 version. In fact, actually, I'll go grab one of the 415s I have. And we can confirm. In fact, I think I've even... Oh, yeah, I even uh, have it partially disassembled. Here we go. So this is one of the uh, four ones that have the 415s. And yeah, I think the, the ones that are, uh, they don't have the dot .35. And they also don't have that other silk screen jumper indicated. As far as the microcontroller, I mean, if you opened it up, you could also look at the microcontroller. So this one says a 415. Now there is another version of the 415s that actually use a smaller footprint microcontroller. So if you would actually have the board open and you see like a really tiny microcontroller that I think the pins are basically, I forget what the package style is. So this is like a, um, Another package style that I'm, I can't remember the name of right offhand. It was probably, um, probably could tell me, but the, the smaller one has, it looks like the, if you've looked at a Raspberry Pi uh, Pico and looked at the microcontroller and it ha seems to have like really small legs, uh, the, the other artery 435 style that has fewer pins looks like that. So if you see one of the little microcontrollers, you have a 415. <laughs> So, 
Hi, Retro Techie. Can always count on you to jump into the chat with some random comment and no, you can't have this. Although, I don't know what I'll do with it right offhand. I'll probably put it in some PC. Um, actually, probably knowing what I know about these, I'm probably just going to start buying the 435 ones going forward so that I don't have to worry about what version I'm trying to use and what computer. But, <laughs> all right. Okay, and now I'm going to find out that I have misplaced all my screwdrivers. Well, that's wonderful. Why do they run away? I don't know why they run away. Um, that's not long enough. Hold on. Hold, please. Yeah. <laughs> well, I don't know, Ryan. I uh, shipping to Canada along with the uh, inevitable GST you'll have to pay. I Um, let's see here. I'm trying to see if I'm missing what I have in the chat. Also, trying to find the screwdrivers that I have creatively misplaced. Which is weird, because... Oh, oh I forgot to turn that off. Well, at least it's not anything that would have, uh, probably burned the house down. All right, hold please while I try to figure out where I put my screwdriver on my workbench because I don't think I've taken it upstairs. And if I did take it upstairs, I've certainly misplaced it. If it wasn't for the fact I have so much to do this weekend, I'd probably clean my workbench off, but instead I'll just keep rearranging tools that cause me to cover up different items on my workbench and trying to find what I'm looking for. Because I actually forgot that I was having trouble finding... Oh, well there's my spudger, which is on the floor. Did I... Hold on, I think I might have knocked my screwdrivers onto the floor. That might be why I can't find any of them. All right. Let me see. I think I've got another. I thought I had another set down here. All right. This is embarrassing. Oh, here we go. That's. Oh, okay. Well, I don't know why it's sitting there. It was beside my oscilloscope. All right. Oh, quick refresher on the GoTek models. So there's... No, we cannot do a quick refresher on the GoTek model. Yeah, Adam, I think you're good. I believe if you've got 4.35, then I think you have the correct ones. Yeah, so uh, looks like maybe when you bought them, you, uh, you got the uh, correct ones. Yeah, there's like uh, 40 bazillion models of Gotex, Sean. I don't think there's a quick summary. Because I'm just looking at the the uh, flash floppy wiki. Um, I can though warn you that there. Um, I'll, let me go ahead and put this in the link in the chat. So if you are interested in 
the flash floppy models. There's the link. So if you were thinking about getting a GoTech to install flash floppy firmware for yourself, and um, or you can, there's a, a couple sellers on eBay that sell them pre-modified. So, uh, which is what I did. Now, these two I bought from another eBay seller, Dasher Deals, because at the time I ordered them, John 5 didn't have any of the 4. Dot uh, 435 based GoTex. However, since since I bought these, John Five actually started selling the 435 models. I believe he has beige with the 435 microcontroller. But I believe if you need one of the other colors with the 435 microcontroller, you can ask him. But I, I, he doesn't have an eBay listing for him. But I think. Uh, he did a video when he uh, released them, and I think he said you can uh, request the other ones. Okay, now I, I've got some people. Uh, oh, I think I've, there's some side conversations because I'm seeing chat conversations about ATA and SCSI. So these are actually floppy drive emulators, so they plug into the floppy interface. Oh, and Adam, yeah, I guess you have one, but. The, the reason I have two is because I just decided I wasn't going to deal with floppies at all on the TRS-80 because I have no, I have no software on disks. Well, okay, I have one, one boot disk, but I have no other software on disk for TRS-80. I'm not likely to buy any disk software for the TRS-80. And apparently the way the TRS-80 DOS works, or at least from what I've seen. Oh, that's okay, Ryan. I chat away. I was just hoping I wasn't missing any questions for me. So um, basically, I decided that uh, because it seemed like the way the TRS works, it doesn't like when you swap disks in the boot drive that if I'd wanted to save software, I, I realized I need to go tech in the drive two, or I guess drives one position so that I could have a, a image for saving disks. But then I want one for the drive zero position so that I could boot different operating systems. I didn't want to have to write operating systems to real physical floppies. So I was like, well, okay, so I need two go techs. If I ever did have got if I ever got physical media for TRS-80 and I needed to archive it, then I've got a grease weasel and I've got five and a quarter inch drives. I can pull, uh, in fact, actually, I can actually take one of the five and a quarter inch drives I pulled out of the TRS-80 Model 4P, just get the correct floppy cable. And so, I mean, I still have the drives. So, and they're actually lubricated and have new drive belts and everything because I unnecessarily did maintenance on them and then decided to replace them with GoTex. Anyways, I can take one of those original drives, take whatever floppy disk I happen to get, take my grease weasel, and, and do the archival that way. Um, well, if I had an applesauce, applesauce would probably do it too. But I don't have an applesauce. I have a grease weasel. Um, and... I think the only thing the Grease Weasel really can't do are the Apple and Macintosh formats. However, there's enough other people in the community that have Apple sauces that if I do ever stumble across something that's not archived, I'll just send it to Steve because it seems like that's all he does these days is archive floppies. And if you're watching Steve, we love you. <laughs> Steve's like, arg. I knew I should have done something other than archive floppies on a stream. <laughs> uh, I do not know if those drives would work. I, I mean, I... I'm going to say maybe, Jeremy, but I don't have the jumper settings for them. They are... 
as far as I can tell, they're set up just as a Shugert interface. So I don't know how well they would work in a PC. But, uh, I mean, I presume if you could change the jumpers, which could be difficult, because I believe the way those drives are jumpered to go in the TRS-80, they are actually jumpered for all drive IDs simultaneously. And the ribbon cable determines which drive ID signal makes it through to the drive. So, uh, yeah, Adam, they are single-sided drives, but so are 360K, or, well, so are 360K drives. They're also single-sided, but I think they're double density. I think, uh, so, Jeremy, actually, the other problem would be I think those drives are single-sided, single density. So, actually, maybe they wouldn't work in a PC. Uh, I, I have a few 360K drives, too. They're just in a, another computer. So. All right. So you're probably wondering why, I'm going to op why I wanted to open these up. And actually, if I can find the other GoTech that I have. So anyways, the upgrade I did for the TRS-80. So I have these GoTechs. I had them jumpered for... Okay, well, this one's not jumpered correctly. Ah, yours are loose. Well, I, I'll keep that in mind. So what I did is because I'm a stickler for certain details where they are not totally annoying to, to correct, is I changed the LED on the GoTex that I put in my TRS-80 Model 4P so that they matched the LED color of the original floppy drives because I thought the green LEDs would just stand out like a sore thumb that this doesn't look right. So I now have two GoTex that don't really work with HFE disk images well enough to keep them in the TRS-80 Model 4P that have red LEDs now that I'll probably put the green ones back in because that just kind of looks weird in a PC. Um, so the, the red LEDs I'm using actually came from Jamco. There are 697 nanometer LEDs. These actually seem to be a pretty close match for what was on the original drive. So I'm going to take the LEDs off the two GoTex that have the correct microcontroller and I'll take the green LED off and put the red LED on. Yeah. Then I will change the jumpers to the correct position for the TRS-80, which is actually to remove the JC jumper and will actually put a jumper on both S0 and S1 because the cable is going to select which one's in use. That way I don't have to worry about putting the wrong drive in the wrong position. The uh, flash floppy.config file does all the rest of the magic for the uh, Go tech. Oh, now there is one. Ah, okay, Adam. I, I can see if you had the green CRT, then the green LEDs would probably look fine. But mine's actually has the white CRT. And with the red power switch, I like the way the red floppy LEDs looked. It 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 matched. But yeah, if you had the green CRT, then I could see the green LEDs would be they would they would look like they belonged so now the other th the other thing that of uh, the 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 real reason why I removed these gotex in the first place it turns out that there was actually something wrong with one of them which is actually what clued me into the that there was an issue but Turns out the issue I was having was completely unrelated to the fact that the microcontroller in them didn't have enough SRAM for HFE disk images. Hey, Biggie John. The problem is that these ones I bought from Retro Friends, uh, one of the GoTex 
and it was this one because I've removed the mod. So Retro Friends sells these, and they come with the speaker mod, where there's a little speaker, and so whenever the disc is accessed, the um, you know it'll click, and it actually is a, a fairly decent approximation of a, I mean as loud as a little piezo speaker can get. I mean, it, it at least gives it a little sound when it's accessing the disc, so, hey. But anyways, so when I got these up and running, I noticed that one of the, the Gotex, I mean, it looked fine during boot, and it happened to be the one that was in the drive one position, because otherwise I probably would have noticed there was a problem much sooner. But the, the computer would boot, and the drive one position one would look normal. Drive Zero would boot into TRS DOS or whichever operating system. And then, and then things would be normal until you actually issued the first DOS command. And then the GoTech in the Drive 1 position, the LCD screen would start flashing like really quickly. It'd, it'd flash on and off. And at first I was thinking, well, is my floppy controller and my TRS-80 going bad? And it's like, trying to access the, the one floppy drive like way too often. And then the more I looked at it, the more I thought about it, I realized, you know, I think there might actually be some electrical problem. So that's why I have my TRS-80 torn apart right now is I had pulled it all open to try to figure out, well, did I have a, like a loose, was the, the power connector loose on the one? Did, did I do something to the cable? Did I like, cut the power splitter and it's shorting to the case or something and I didn't see anything wrong so that's when I actually popped this one open and I realized that on the speaker mod there was a wire strand going from the one the terminal where the the motor signal is and it was touching one of the other pins so the the reason why the display was flashing is because there was a a uh, short somewhere where it shouldn't have been on the GoTech itself I was like so once I removed the speaker mod this GoTech seems to work fine but I, I don't I don't know that I trust it because I don't know exactly what it was shorting to to know was it shorting to a like was it shorting to something where it the component had enough capability to survive for the couple minutes that it would have been powered up with a short, or have I severely um, compromised it? So I, I won't, I, I mean, I'm not gonna throw it away, but I'm not going to install this one in anything that would be really annoying to have to remove it. So, um, <laughs> so I'll probably end up putting it in some PC that would be easy to remove. Um, <laughs> <laughs> 47 Apple twos. <laughs> oh, I don't know. Um, at three more Apple twos there, Adam, and you'll be at the, uh, uh, actually, uh, one more. And I guess you'd be at the, the 48 kind of a magic number when it comes to Apple twos. So anyways, uh, the GoTex that come from Dasher Deals, they don't do the speaker mod. I'm not going to do the speaker mod. I'm just going to do the LED mod and get on with it. So, anyways. Um, so, for this mod, I'm going to, I'm actually going to use lead-free solder since these boards are uh, lead-free boards. I don't, I don't think I'll need to use any flux as the, the solder wick that I have has flux in it and the solder is uh, fresh enough that it should just come off with some solder braid and then I'll, uh, I'll just tack it back on with the lead free solder. So I'm uh, just marking the two connectors here so that I can get them back on. I guess I'll take a picture as well. Yeah, actually, I mean, I mean the Zenith XT clone, that'd be a good one to put it in because it, uh, 
yeah, I'll hold it for the XT clone. It's the correct, uh, it, it would match the case. And it's actually fairly easy to, to get those in and out should I realize that the, um, if it stopped working because that short uh, actually did damage. So yeah, that's a good idea. Um, because, um, yeah, and in fact, actually the red LEDs might match what was it originally in it too. So anyways, yeah, that's a good computer to put them in. I'll hold them for that. So, uh. Maybe, maybe someday that computer will, uh, will uh, start making its journey from the um, great, great white north or whatever the, they, uh, one of the uh, nicknames for Canada is. And uh, no huge rush because I, I did recently send something to Germany and re-remembered exactly how much shipping costs internationally. Although, while I was uh, mailing that item to Germany, I did discover that Pirate Ship has uh, a program for international shipping, and I may ask them if they'll add it to my account. And for uh, smaller packages, it gives you much better rates, because I think what they do is they uh, basically... You ship the item to a center and it gets, I guess, bundled into a pallet or something. And then I get, the pallet gets sent. So I, I guess basically it's probably like a freight forwarding service. It had really good rates. But I, I needed to send the item to Germany, so I, uh, I sent it. I'm uh, swapping, uh, I'm uh, trading hardware with someone. So, yeah, um, so I, uh, someone on uh, Twitter posted a picture of two motherboards and they were like, could uh, anyone use one of these? And I replied back, yeah, I, I could. So he was wanting, uh, he was looking for a trade of either a, um, a, like sound cards or AGP video cards. So it turns out I found a um, an AGP video card that that he was looking for that I had that, that the requirements were it had to be cheap and it had to be untested but have a a decent chance of actually working. So I found a video card that was cheap and untested, but I I had a, a good chance of thinking that it would actually work. And it was actually a GeForce 2 GTS video card. And in exchange, uh, he's going to send me an untested, but probably good chance of working, uh, Chaintech Socket 7 motherboard. I think it, it has a processor on it too. So, ooh, an exciting part for a Mac SE30. Oh. Also, if anyone was watching the uh, uh, Marchintosh launch video and heard me saying that I was trying to acquire an SE30, apparently uh, the person had sold it. I, th I think the person uh, are, had already s lined up someone else to buy it by the time I asked them if they would take the price that I was willing to pay. So when they replied back, sorry, I, uh, I realized that after the listing disappeared and they said they'd take it down when it sold, I realized that wasn't, sorry, I can't take your deal. That was, sorry, I've already sold it and I'm waiting for the person to pick it up. <laughs> um, uh, Ryan, you're joking about useless Trident cards and uh, let's just say that I'm having, a, I have a slightly different opinion of Trident cards today than I did uh, was it Sunday on Dave's stream, or, or actually it might have been on my stream. So, yeah, David. Um, oh, well, yeah, I I like uh, 3D FX cards too, but um, the problem is the the person I'm trading with um doesn't have steady enough hands to repair cards, and I think he's realized that for this trade. Uh, 3DFX cards have a uh, good 
chance of actually not working. So I, I did um I, I didn't even offer a 3DFX card. I didn't have one, but I knew that one was probably not going to be a card he would want. So Oh hey Rudy. But yeah, the uh, GeForce 2 GTS was one he was looking for. And I actually had a it was an Asus V7700 Deluxe to offer. And that one actually not only uh, did it, does it have the, um, I guess the uh, VGA out as many cards did of the day. It actually has a video in and video out. So it looked like the card had video capture capabilities. So it's actually kind of a neat card. So, I mean, I actually quite honestly wouldn't mind having a, a, a GeForce 2 GTS to try myself, honestly. It kind of looks like it was a neat card of the time period. In fact, it might even make a good complement to my Pentium 2 system. Might be a bit more period accurate than a GeForce 4MX, but. I also kind of thought the uh, prospect of a, a it's, but I do remember when I worked at the computer shop, we sold a lot of chain tech boards and quite honestly, it looked familiar. I mean, I know since that board's in Europe, I, I doubt that's one of the ones I sold. Although I guess you never know when we sold one to someone that was in the military and they moved to Europe and that board made it to, <laughs> made it to, <laughs> The, the person I'm trading with, uh, I mean, stranger things have happened, but um, I, I suspect it's a lot like the boards we did sell because the, the model looks familiar. So I suspect it is one of the models we sold and I probably have built systems on it before. So that's kind of what caught my eye is that it just looked familiar. Um, I mean, yeah. Yeah, I know. Uh, Adrian Black despises Trident cards, and uh, last week I was saying, oh, I'm glad Adrian told everyone not to buy them because now that means I'll have video cards I can actually afford. But uh, after, after starting to test my Trident card I bought from Canada, I, uh, um, and noticing that uh, either my Emerson PC has a lot of noise inside the case that seems to be making its way out the VGA port, or I have uh, managed to buy a yet another Trident card that is showing early signs of degradation. Um, I'm, uh, <laughs> I, I think my opinion's quickly changing on those Trident cards. So, uh, although I'm still streaming tomorrow, I still have a stack of Trident cards that I'm going to try to make a couple working. And, I may fail miserably. I may, uh, I may fail so miserably that I have to ask if anyone's got a uh, non-Trident card they'd be willing to donate to the channel. <laughs> it's a 16-bit ISA card. <laughs> but I'm still going to give it the college try, as they say, and try to fix it. Yeah, the, um, I mean, I remember selling a lot of Trident cards because they were the low cost option, even if they were also the low performance option. So, all right, now if this uh, LED will, I think I, oh, okay. I think I did find, I think it's desoldered. There we go. All right. So let me make sure that I have the polarity lined up. Okay, so positive. Yep. All right. And so that's, so I'm going to hold on to that green LED. So if I need to put it back in a, undo my mod in a GoTech, I can just use this LED. Uh, it even has the correct bend in it. So the way I was doing these is I was taking the old LED and the new LED and I was kind of trying to hand form the 
new LED until it roughly matched the profile I need. And then probably realizing that I had the LED backwards when I did that. Yep. So, well, we'll, uh, there we go. And I think that'll have enough slack in it to, um, I, I will try recapping them. I think I've got enough, I think I've got enough capacitors of the right values to recap them but I'm not convinced the capacitors are what's causing the problem. I, I kind of think that one of the components might have been a subpar component and that might be what's causing the problem. I, I just don't, I don't have a good feel on what it is yet, but I'm hoping after tomorrow's stream, I might figure it out, but then again, Maybe it is the capacitors, but I'm also not going to be surprised if I figure out that it's the, uh, something like the oscillator or the uh, crystal or, or a component like that. So, all right. So I, So yeah. Anyways, uh, but yeah, I've got um, I've got plenty of um, I, th these are what of a lot of PC expansion cards used. These are um, like ten microfarad, twenty five volt. So I've got these. They're a bit larger, and I also have. Somewhere on my bench, I've got another bag of, I believe they're like Panasonic ones that are the next size down. So I do, I do have 10 microfarad, 25 volt caps, which is what a lot of expansion card used if they had electrolytics. So I, I will try replacing the capacitors, but I'm also going to tell you just as a teaser of the cards that I have to repair, Um, well, that's not, that's not a fair one. So of the ones I've got to repair, I've got this one here. This is the card I bought off eBay and it didn't work and I got refunded. So the card sinks, but there's no image. So I don't think, I don't think the capacitors are at fault there. Cause in fact, I think I already recapped this one. And then here's the one that I had in the Emerson 386 where the, the image starts getting jittery and the longer it's on, the longer it's jittery. No, this is the one I recapped already. I think I did recap this one and that didn't fix it. That's not to say though that the other ones in my pile aren't different reasons because the, the one I got from Canada, it, it isn't quite as jittery as the one I got off um, eBay that I had in the Emerson. So, I mean, maybe it is just caps because it isn't quite as bad as the other. So anyways, that, that's a teaser for tomorrow. I'm gonna try to repair some video cards. It, it'll be fun. Maybe I'll fix them. Maybe I'll, maybe we'll just have a good time and I end up having to scrap them all or throw them in my parts bin, but we'll have good time. And uh, that'll kind of be a warm up to my sync and computer a thon or whatever I called it. So, and that'll be Monday starting at 1 p.m. ES Eastern Standard Time. And I'll go for, I mean, I'll, I'll go for, well, I mean, I, I will eventually call it. Uh, there may be a few interruptions during the stream because I'm expecting a package that I'll have to sign for, but uh, I'll stream for, I'm planning on streaming for a while. So I don't know exactly what I'm going to do yet. Uh, it might be a wide variety of things, but um, I, do, I do know I, I have another project that might be a candidate for that stream. 
although I really probably won't do that in the basement. So I, I, I may end up like doing part of the stream upstairs and then starting a new stream to come downstairs or because I don't have StreamYard to, to make that transition. Um, trying to find my cutters, which have mysteriously disappeared as well. <sighs> you know, sometimes I think gremlins come and rearrange my workbench. But I think in reality, the problem is I moved my, oh yeah, I moved my voltmeter during Dave's stream because I was showing off that I had a fluke meter. And I suspect when I did that, a whole bunch of tools, uh, I, I bet I moved a bunch of tools because the cable was too short. All right. Um, so let me see, I'm trying to follow the chat. Um, does the, okay, I, oh, you know, I did not, all uh, right, I just did something stupid, let me, uh, let me go get that thing I just clipped, <laughs> I just clipped the pin off that, uh, LED, and it went sailing, uh, and where it went sailing, I just need to make sure it's not now sitting on my oscilloscope circuit board because I haven't put the lid back on my oscilloscope because I need to print a 3D spacer for the GoTech in my oscilloscope so that it I can actually screw it in. Um, and I sent a lead sailing potentially into my open oscilloscope. Uh, I don't, okay, so it looks like maybe it's not actually on my oscilloscope. Okay, I just wanted to make sure that I probably should make myself a note to uh, check that again before I power my oscilloscope up tomorrow night. So if you will hold on one moment, I am going to mute myself so that I don't activate your personal assistant. So if you see me talking and can't hear me, that's because I'm talking to a device that LGR calls flub, flub nerb or nerb flub or something like that. Okay, add it to today's reminders. All right, we're good. <laughs> Well, uh, it's not, you know, the, the clipped off leads that make it to the floor, I'm not as worried about because I just these days always wear some sort of a shoe down in the basement. It's the ones that are like land in things that I've left open because I'm not done repairing them. Like the expensive, well, okay. It didn't cost me a lot of money, but it was an expensive oscilloscope at the time. And it is the oscilloscope I use, so. Um, I don't want to short it out. Although, granted, you know, I, I think I would trust a Tektronix scope. Probably has better protections in it for when you do a dumb than, say, a, a hand tech does. So, it would probably be a... Uh, probably, I, I would say, would be something that I bet the Tektronix would recover from with a uh, power cycle and possibly waiting like 10 or 15 minutes for some soft fuse to reset itself, but yeah. Then again, I could be surprised. Maybe the Tektronix scopes are like uh, one shorted, uh, one short inside the oscilloscope and you would have thought that a uh, movie special effects department was uh, about to shoot an action thriller finale in your lab. Hey Dave, welcome. Oh, the oscilloscope that I have. So I have a, it is a Tektronix PDS 524A. It's one that they uh, scrapped at work and I, uh, they were, they were just like scrapping some older equipment and I, 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 I claimed it first. So it didn't cost me anything other than the few minutes to do a little bit of paperwork for the, requesting the the 
official permission to remove it as scrap, and then the effort to haul it to my car because uh, for anyone that's not seen these Tektronix scopes in the, the TDS 500 series, they're, they're chunks. <laughs> I mean, they're, the, they're CRT scopes and they're quite heavy. But the cool thing is, and the reason why I did the GoTech, put a GoTech in it, the floppy drive was, was trash. Uh, I don't, I don't, I don't know why the floppy drive was non-functional. Maybe it need recapped, but you couldn't really get it apart to recap it. But the whatever was wrong with the original floppy drive in it, it would. I, I actually took it apart enough to actually see what it was doing. But if you tried to format a disk in it, it would actually start formatting in the middle of the disk. So it, it's like it was start, it, it thought track zero was in the middle of the disk. So it would, it would like format from the middle of the disk all the way inside, but then it would go to track what was actually track zero and finish the format. And I'm like, uh, that's not right. <laughs> so, um, so anyways, that, there's the first GoTech modded. And all I need to do to put this in the TRS-80 is, let me see here. So they come, this is how they're pre-jumpered from the factory and, or at least from Dasher deals. Um, so anyways, um, if, if you're buying these on eBay, I would actually recommend checking out John, the eBay seller John Five because they are actually uh, fellow YouTuber retro friends. But I, again, I uh, I bought these before he had the the uh, the ones with the the Artery four thirty five microcontrollers, so that's why I bought them from Dasher Deals. But if uh, but if you're you were buying uh, GoTex now. Check out John Five on eBay because that's uh, Retro Friends on YouTube. So red LED screen. Uh, actually, you know, I might at some point see if I can find a red filter to put in front of it. That that actually might be pretty cool. Although the thing is, the uh, the white OLED screen does match the white phosphor pretty well, the white phosphor and the CRT pretty well. So it actually is not as bad of a combination as you might think. Um, oh yeah, he might have switched by that time. So anyways, so there's the first one modded. So let me see if I can put this somewhere where I know it's the one that I need to put in the TRS-80. All right, so let me get the other one. Oh, there it is. And we'll mod it real quick. So actually, the um, if it if it's of uh, says anything, I did put a GoTech in my Emerson three eighty six. Now it originally had floppy drives with amber LEDs, so I actually did an amber LED mod on the floppy drive that I, or the, uh, did an LED, uh, an amber LED mod to the GoTech I put in the Emerson 386. So you'll see that when I get the video done on that. And uh, the reason why that video hasn't come out is the, the inspiration for tomorrow's stream is the exact reason that you haven't seen that video yet because I need, <laughs> I don't have a work a video card that works correctly in that computer, so I haven't been able to do the B-roll <laughs> because I am not doing the B-roll uh, uh, with the uh, video and it looking as horrible. I mean, granted, the one I've got in it now is the one from Canada, and it looks like uh, a little better, but it's still there, there's something wrong. I got, there's jail bars on the screen and. Uh, 
which which isn't right. So, and, and the it's um the text is wobbly. So, yeah, that that's why you haven't seen my the the video I wanted to do for DOS Simber on the Emerson three eighty six is because I have had video card trouble in that computer. It started with having a video card, uh, the video card that came in it can't support enough colors to run the software that I'm going to run for that video. And then every video card that I've bought to put in it has had something wrong with it. And I'm getting tired of buying video cards with problems, but I'm gonna try to repair some. So if I can repair video cards to, in tomorrow's stream, then hopefully that'll let me finish that video whenever I can get it back into the production queue. So that's where that video is right now. It's in on hold because of hardware problems. Because I could just slap a video together, but if I'm gonna take the time to make and edit a video, I want it to at least be, well, I, I, I want to at least be able to do what I want to do, not stopped by the fact that I don't have a functional video card. <laughs> I mean, it, it would be one thing if the video card was the upgrade I was trying to do and it didn't work and the conclusion of the video is, um, well, it didn't work. Sometimes it doesn't work out. But actually the upgrade isn't that I'm documenting isn't the video card. Although certainly I could probably make another video out of that, but well, that that will go to the back of the queue. I got enough other videos to do. And then the the TRS-80 video that I want to do on the GoTech upgrade. Well, now that one I put on hold because, uh, firstly because I realized I had the wrong GoTechs. Well, I, firstly because the one GoTech had the problem with it that was causing the the LEDs or the the OLED to flash, which was actually, I think, the the GoTech continuously getting reset because of that short, uh, which that just that wasn't right. Um, I, I wanted to at least make sure that the, um, I mean, if I figured out the problem was that oh, there's a hardware problem with the computer, I wanted to at least try to fix that. And if I'd figured out the problem was, well, GoTex just don't work on a TRS-80, then that would have been the conclusion of the video. But in reality, I determined that, well, th there was actually a problem with the GoTech unrelated to the upgrade. And also I bought the wrong GoTex actually. So I, I put that video on hold until I could get the correct GoTex, which are the two I'm modding now. And yeah. Oh, so, oh, oh, yeah, Sloppy Bell would be the TDS-224. That's actually, yeah, that is a nice small one. Um, uh, Jeremy, I'll let you know if, if I uh, fail. Um, to get a working video card. I mean, I might, uh, I might have some insight into the pile of video cards I have beside me, and I, I think I have enough to make at least one working video card. Uh, because the one I didn't show, that the one that I, I started to show, and I said, "Oh, well, this isn't a good example." Um, I, I think I admitted to buying some parts video cards on eBay. And one of the parts video cards, the 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 graphics chip on it's physically damaged. It there's like pins pushed in. So I'm actually thinking that that card might actually work, if it weren't for the fact that the GPU has pins that I don't think I'll be able to repair because of the way they're pushed in. So. There we go. So I'm I'm hoping that I I actually have parts to fix at least one video card. 
Because I think the video card that won't that uh, will sync but has no image. I'm actually the, actually the first thing I'm going to try on it is I'm actually going to take the uh, RAM DAC off of the card that the 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 video chip is damaged, and I'm going to see if replacing the RAM DAC fixes the the issue. Because I'm, I'm kind of wondering if maybe the RAM DAC is just not reading RAM. And if that's not the case, then I may swap the memory. But I'm thinking the first one is either the RAM DAC. Actually, I'm, I'm pretty convinced it's the RAM DAC. All right, there we go. And the second one's modded. And there we go. And then I think the the one that I bought off eBay where the, the image is starts to, to get unstable right away. Um I, I think I, I might try recapping it because I don't think I recapped it. I'll have to check though. I think one of the cards I've had actually had uh, all tantalums on it. I don't remember which card it was. But, um, and if recapping it doesn't work, I'm going to swipe the crystal off of one of those cards and try replacing the crystal. Because I'm thinking it might, uh, the crystal might be going bad. At, meaning the RAM DAC, which I think on that card, the RAM DAC also generates the, the clock for the video signal. Kind of, my suspicion is that maybe the RAM DAX or the crystals failing and the RAM DAX not getting a proper signal. So whatever clock signals driving is wrong. But anyways, that's just a preview of my suspicions. All right, there we go. So there we go. One. So I've got two GoTex. They've got the red LEDs on them. And uh, I've got the USB drive for the, um, I got the USB drive over on the TRS-80. Uh, so I've, uh, each one has its own dedicated drive. Um, oh yeah, that's, uh, okay, let me, uh, Hold on, let me fix one other thing about one of these GoTex. I just realized I uh, I broke the I broke a plastic piece on one of them. Since they're going in a TRS-80 Model 4P, and it's kind of a pain to open it up to fix, and I don't want the power connector to come loose. I'm uh. I broke the uh, plastic, uh, I'll, I'll show you what plastic piece I broke on it. So I'm swiping it off of another GoTech. Uh, until I can f find the, uh, I've got a Berg power connector that I'll solder onto this GoTech I'm stealing it from. Anyways, if you notice this uh, GoTech has the plastic uh, piece with the area where the the Berg power connector clips. Well, I, I broke it on that one. So I just stole that plastic piece there. So I just need to carefully slide this off. Oh, I'm just Carefully sliding it off. So, yep, let me fix this and then I'll go grab the 
I'll, I'll, I'll go over, I'll grab the drive cage, and we'll start putting the new Gotex in the There we go. Here we go. All right, so now I know, yeah, now I know that the power connector is not going to come off easily on the TRS-80. I've got the jumper set. So I've got the jumper set on both S0 and S1 because the cable will select which one it is. And ready to start putting these back together. So let me go get the drive cage. If I can turn my soldering iron off, no need to wear the tip anymore. And while I am grabbing the parts, don't forget to smash that like button. And if you're not already subscribed, well, what are you waiting for? I live stream a lot and also attempt to make videos when things cooperate. And if you subscribe, there'll be a better chance you'll see the video in your feed. And if you ring the notification bell, then you probably will definitely have a better chance of actually knowing when I go live or upload a video. Because I do know one thing, while YouTube's notifications aren't perfect, if you don't enable them, well, you won't get notified at all. If you do, notif do enable them, then, well, if YouTube's feeling nice, then you will probably get one. All right. So for the, the upgrade that I did, I decided to actually go with a StarTech adapter because I kind of wanted more of a finished look than if I'd 3D printed it and you'd see all the layers or I'd, or I'd had to print some adapter like on the bed and find a bed that actually had a texture and then maybe it would have looked better, but I wanted something that actually looked factory. So I got the StarTech adapter. Now the only one problem is if you do put the one of these in the TRS-80, the TRS-80 screws are like Four, I think they're like four or five millimeters forward of where the drive screws finally standardized. So these, these two screw holes and these two screw holes are the standard PC locations. If you were put them in a modern PC, I had to drill holes. I think they're like four or five millimeters ahead or forward of the now standardized locations, so. Oh, that's why. That... There we go. So anyways, you, uh, so that'll fit nice in the adapter. And let me see, I've got the screws. So I actually normally would buy StarTech things probably off Amazon. But in this case, I think I bought these two adapters off eBay because I didn't really care if they were used, if they looked in good shape. So I, I had saved a few bucks and bought them on eBay. I think there were people that bought them and then bought them and never used them. And interest, I, and I, I found some listings where they, uh, there, there actually was a savings, because there were also a bunch of people listing them for list price plus shipping. So, all right, one. 
Okay. So the one annoying thing is trying to get these screws started because if you've got a new GoTech, these screws are not, they're not pre-threaded. These are self-threading screws. And this trick is trying to start them. And actually I could start it here because of the way the, the size of these screws. I can start all four of them and then put them back in the bracket and finish them because the screw heads will actually fit through the hole in the bottom of the bracket. And then I push this drive forward all the way and then screw them down. You'll, you'll see here in a moment. So let me get these screws started. It helped to... There we go. Basically, I'm going to put this drive in, in the, the holder. While I've got this one still mount, uh, th this one still mounted, so that I can line things up, and then I'll take that one out, and swap it out. So, anyways, then I, well, I may have to unscrew some of these screws okay okay i thought that i could leave those in but actually i think the fact that i just started those will do what i need to do so let me get that in put the uh Oh, cool. Some new old stock StarTech Beige hot swap drive bays. Yeah. Oh, that's, I think I was mentioning something that I had that I might do on my stream Monday. So I actually, so I had to recently re, I guess, rebuild my NAS because I've got, a, I, I built a NAS using, at the time it would have been free NAS. And I'd bought some used, used motherboard that was it was a sand i think it was a sandy bridge era motherboard so i bought the motherboard it had some low-end sandy bridge processor in it it had ram it actually had 16 megabytes of ram on it it had six six sata channels on the motherboard it was actually came in a case that was a case that had a five drive sata backplane on it and I built a, uh, I built a NAS using it. And actually, I'd probably been using it for quite a while. And uh, it was a couple weeks ago, the, the motherboard died. Like, badly died. It, uh, it was... The NAS was kind of operating slowly, and then I thought, oh, it's going slowly because there's an update. So I let it update, and it never came back from the reboot in the update process. Okay, I'm having, having trouble getting these screws to... Oh, that's why I'm having trouble getting these screws to engage. Because I didn't use the bottom screw holes on the uh, other Gotex. Okay, that's why. So anyways, I, uh, luckily I had a spare motherboard and spare RAM, and the motherboard had eight SATA channels on it. But the thing is, the motherboard won't fit the case that I had my NAS in. Because the motherboard I had on hand was an ATX case, or an ATX motherboard. 
and it was a mini ITX case. So anyways, I, uh, I broke down and bought a, a case on Amazon that has hot swap. So it, it's an ATX case and it has eight hot swap trays built into it. Because actually I would have, um, I mean, I would have probably Well, I wanted hot sock trays because that was the one thing this case that I had didn't have, even though it had a back plane and the back plane in the case had supported hot swap. It didn't have trays, so you had to like open the case and on the inside pull the drive. So now I've got it seems like a proper case for a NAS because it's got the hot swap trays and a, a, a lock on the door. For, I mean. I'm sure it's not a super secure lock, but at least it's something to keep the door closed. Keep the incidental prying fingers from saying, oh, look, you can remove these and uh, invalidate the uh, files by pulling drives. Oh, screw doesn't go there. So anyways, one of the things I may do on my stream Monday, I may actually build that uh, actually, install my uh, NAS hardware into the case. I mean, it seems like, well, I, I haven't opened the box yet, but at least from the pictures, it seems like it'll be a nice case. Cost more than I really wanted to spend, but I really, really need to put, right now the NAS is in the floor. I've, the motherboard sitting on the motherboard box on the floor. Uh, the drives are still in the back plane in this case. Because the motherboard won't fit in the case, I wasn't about to pull the drives out of the back plane. I don't have enough power connectors. So I do need to put it in a case because I, I think it's interfering with my uh, radio that I wake up to, not having the, the motherboard in a case. So... Um, yeah, I need to fix that. Anyway, I may, uh, do that. Put, build, put it all in the case. It'll be nice. Uh, I'm running some, uh, Hitachi something or others. I don't remember what drives they are. They're, they're enterprise. They are enterprise hard drives. But they're actual spinning hard drives. At least the one nice thing is now that I upgraded the motherboard in the NAS, not because I willingly upgraded it, but the uh, motherboard that I ended up using has 2.5 gigabit Ethernet ports on it. And fortunately, it actually has their Intel Ethernet ports, so they work just fine with true NAS, but I, and now I guess that's one thing I've been wanting to do was get, uh, upgrade the part of my network that I do video editing on to 2.5 gigabit ethernet. So at least now my NAS can support it. Now granted I, and, and the Ethernet cables I have in the house are all the correct category. But I just got to buy a, a 2.5 gigabit switch, and those are a little bit pricey still. But I only need enough of a switch to connect my NAS and... Um, I guess video editing computer and this computer down here for streaming. So I think I can get away with like a the smallest 2.5 gigabit switch that they make. But at the moment, I I mean that that's a later project. I mean right now I'm just happy that I think I can s saturate the network copying files to the NAS. 
on gigabit network. Um, by uh, not terrible to buy, are you talking like they're uh, under three hundred dollars? Because if I spend money on network equipment, it's probably either going to be under $300 or it better look like Zodium's new Wi-Fi router and all those antennas better be functional too. Although I don't, I think he, I don't know what he spent on it, but. <laughs> oh, uh, we don't have, uh, we don't have, I don't have fiber internet yet, but I think the power company is running fiber in there right away. They're, they're, They've got some crew installing something on the main power poles along the highway. I can't tell what exactly it is, but they're only running one cable. So I'm thinking it might actually be fiber cable. I usually thought they buried fiber, but maybe in this case, since they're installing it in their right of way, and it looks like their right of way might be a non-burial right away along the highway because the, the power is not buried there. I, I guess maybe they're running fiber on the poles. I mean, that doesn't sound that reliable for when a storm comes and a tree falls on the power lines, but. Oh, okay. So I, that probably is what they're running. They probably are running fiber. I mean, also, whatever cable they're running doesn't look very thick. But then again, I guess nowadays you get a lot of... I mean, I guess it's probably a backbone and they'll have some sort of a... box somewhere. But yeah, I, I, they probably are running fiber in the right of way. So hopefully that means they'll uh, they'll get uh, the rest of the fiber. I think they were trying to deploy the fiber this year. Because quite honestly, they probably got some grant or something to do it. But yeah, they're they're running fiber in there right away, and then I think the plan is they'll they'll lease it to internet service providers. Because I, I guess they don't want it, the the power company or the power co-op doesn't really want to get in the internet business, but but they want to help get internet fiber internet out because well the thing is they've got the right of way to do it. So that'll be. Yeah, I, I I suspect they'll they'll get a pretty decent. Uh, I mean, they'll get a pretty decent return on their investment, and and that um, the ISP will still be able to charge a reasonable price. Yeah, not like yeah, that's true. Not like putting copper on poles. Yeah. All right. Oh, there we go. So I got the one GoTech in. So let me get the other uh, GoTech out and swap it. Oh well, right now we have. Comcast, and then a distant second, we have CenturyLink. 
And quite honestly, I don't know what Century that Century Link is, or is it Lumos now? I don't, I can't keep track of their names. Uh, and by Century Link, I think they might mean like the 18th Century Link, because it seems like their Century Link isn't offering that great of a service in our area. There we go. All right. But yeah, the, the co-op is, I guess, running the, the fiber in there right away. It looks like they're doing it alongside the highway. And then I guess at some point they'll start trenching. Because I think at some point they're right away They've got burial right away, or at least, well, when they get to our subdivision, they'll be able to trench the fiber because their right away is is un, is underground. And actually, if I know what day they're actually going to be installing fiber in our neighborhood, if I can figure out what time they're going to be on my street. I may uh, I may take half a day and uh, watch them install the fiber, because <laughs> actually uh, I I kind of find it neat they've got the the I guess the machinery that can trench cables and they don't even have to to dig a hole it can just basically run it uh, right under your driveway or at least I hope that's what they're doing. I mean, I suspect that they probably will, they're whoever, I mean, I think they're having a contractor do it for them. But I, I suspect, because that would be a lot of, that would be a lot of driveways that would have to repair. <laughs> I suspect they probably will do the method where it gets trenched under the driveway so that the, to minimize the number of driveways that they would then have to repair. Because I, I think in Virginia they do have to, at least uh, if they, uh, if maintaining the cables they have in the right of way requires them to dig up a driveway, I think they at least do have to eventually repair the driveway. Although I think I've heard though, if they have to dig up any plants, that's not something they have to replace. But I think they do have to fix your driveway. So I, I suspect they probably will do the method where they trench it under driveways because that would be a lot of driveways. You just add up the number of power customers they have <laughs> in subdivisions with buried power lines. Yeah, I suspect they'll they'll zip that right under driveways as much as they can in so yeah i think i think when they do start running fiber in our neighborhood i'm far enough in the subdivision that i probably i know i won't be on day 1 although cuz if they crank that fast then well <laughs> fine i'll i'll miss watching it but yeah i'll uh, i'll try to figure out when when they actually do uh, run fiber. Past my house, I'll probably uh, take like half a day off and actually just, <laughs> especially if it's like a warm day or a nice day, just <laughs> watch them, uh, watch them run the fiber down the street. I mean, I'm probably not the first one to have done that. Probably won't be the last one, but I'm like, yeah, I'll just, uh, And, and yes, I guess I, I might even uh, film it and do a short if the crew is not too weirded out by that. But I probably have a couple months at least before they get that far. Because yeah, I'm sure there's probably other people that would also be interested to watch.
fiber get cable getting pulled under a driveway. I mean, it's not something you see every day. It, unless you actually work on one of those crews, then I guess you do see it every day. <laughs> For the average consumer, it's not something you see every day of getting to see them trench wire under a driveway. Oh yeah. Yeah, and, and Virginia, we definitely have uh we, we have the soil that they can they can use those systems. It's a lot of that red clay mud. So, yeah. Yes, I I could see that if you're in an area where they can't use those trenchers that yeah, they would they would be uh digging up a lot of driveways and even potentially um, bringing out jackhammers depending on how close the rock is in places to the top of the soil but yeah fortunately we're uh, I mean that's not to say that there's not rocks in places and that that won't turn out that there's like some rock right under my driveway, but considering the power lines are running under the driveway now, and I suspect the fiber will, if, if I'm guessing correctly, the fiber would actually be run above the power lines that are underground. I suspect there's probably not any rocks they'd have to contend with because they would have already had to contend with them when they put the power lines in. What? 20, 25 years ago. Yeah, don't know, don't know exactly when, I'm, my house is like just about 20 years old. But I don't know when they ran the power lines in the subdivision. It could actually it could have been as long as 30 years ago. Because the house I'm in is one of the newest houses in the subdivision. So. Someone already dealt with any rocks that were underground. Oh yeah, yep. Oh, they run everything. Okay, Ryan, yeah. And they run everything to the outside of the house by pole, nothing underground. Oh, yeah. Yeah, they're um yes, I guess in that case if the, you got that type of soil and bedrock and whatnot, I guess they would burying things would be very difficult. I guess they'd probably be limited to uh, Probably burying uh, water. If you've got municipal water and sewer, I guess that'd be buried, but. Yeah. I can see that that would be a, a dissentive to trying to run power and other lines like that underground because it'd be expensive. Yep, Jeremy, a 90 year old house. Yep, I actually. Uh, I guess when I was in, uh, I guess would have been in high school and middle school. I guess the house we were in would have been, well, I guess the house we were in then actually might be 90 years old now. So yep, I know what the older houses are like. They can be charming. They can have fun electrical problems while you're watching the house while your parents are uh, at the beach. Although, luckily, uh, luckily they knew something was up, so Dad warned me to uh, keep an eye out for the odd thing they were experiencing and made sure I had the phone number for the electrician, because sure enough, that mid middle of that week, while I was watching the house, I did have to call the electrician. And luckily, uh, they were able to fix the problem. <laughs> and pretty much replaced the uh, main panel in the house and at least half the circuit breakers. Yeah, apparently the, the, the problem, it turned out the uh, 
apparently the the seal on the meter had failed or something like that or maybe it wasn't installed correctly i i don't know exactly why but anyways the uh, water had been able to seep in at the meter and was running through the service cable and then dripping in the breaker panel so slowly over a number of years it was uh so i guess basically it turns out that it it took the uh, enough damage that it was obviously water and um so it was like every time it would rain heavy it would cause some water to seep in and it would drip onto the breaker panel and i think thinking back on it every time we had the weird electrical problems in the house it was after a rain yep so it, it would drip and it would it started corroding things and then um it was causing uh, connection issues. So yeah, some of the breakers were you could they were you could tell they were actually arcing. So yeah, uh, luckily, uh, luckily, it, while I was watching the house and Dad Warren was like, "Okay, if you see this, this is the problem we've been having. Call the electrician. Here's his number. He'll come out, and don't worry because just." Tell him to send us a bill because he's he, he's good with that. So it was um an electrician we knew, so they were able to send the bill. So I did not not a like high school uh, or I guess I was in college at the time, so it wasn't like I was a college student paying it the uh, electrician that week. So uh, don't I don't want to know what the bill was, but probably a bargain compared to what it could have been. But yeah. Um, Basically, I uh, <laughs> yeah that that some of those breakers were like um very close to dangerous because I was microwaving something and the microwave started like browning out and so I went down walked down to the basement and so I get down to the basement to see sparks coming out of the circuit breaker panel so <laughs> yeah that was the uh, that was the big clue to uh, yep time to uh, very carefully uh, stop using power in the house. So, yep, uh, electrician got it fixed. And they sealed the panel. No more problems. Anyways, okay, I got the drives in the carrier. So let's... Uh... Oh, yeah. So, yeah. Oh wow, Jeremy, six foot seven inches. Okay, uh, maybe our house wasn't quite that old because I think we the house did at least have eight foot ceilings, uh, which is probably good because my youngest brother is six foot six. <laughs> that that um. And he was six foot six while uh, mom and dad still lived in that house. Uh, six foot seven ceilings would have uh, um, would have been just a bit short for him. <laughs> I mean, okay, maybe the ceilings weren't quite eight foot. I I do know that the. The ceiling fans were uh... <laughs> I mean he, no, it's not like his head was hitting the ceiling fans, but there was a if, um he was definitely tall enough he could uh, reach up and I ain't touch the ceiling. So yeah, all right, so got the TRS-80. I don't know if I'm gonna be able to zoom out far enough to show working on this, but. So I got the TRS-80 model 4P on the bench. What you can't see is I've got a Noctua fan installed in it. And then I have the, so this is the original cable. I just have some uh, adapters, so go from the card edge to the pins on the GoTech. And then, 
So here's the original power connectors. I just put a splitter on one of them, so. Yeah, yeah, if my brother came down to your place, Jeremy, he'd be dodging light bulbs and, uh, um, for sure. Yeah, I'm, I'm, yeah, I have two brothers and, uh, my youngest is the tallest and I'm the shortest. Go figure. All right, so. Yeah, I, I did this this way partially because I, I didn't really want to have to replace the the cable, the floppy cable, because it was in good condition. I mean, I'm pretty sure it would have been okay, but. All right, so. All right, so get the uh, floppy drives connected. Let me reconnect the power. I'm trying to do this without uh, disconnecting the cable because I got it all zip tied, all nice and neat. And if I clip zip ties, then I'll have to go find where I've got my zip ties hiding. I mean, I think they're on the shelf, the shelf on my bench here. There we go. All right, so I will, uh, I'm gonna plug this in while I've got everything open and make sure that the uh, floppy drives seem to be working. Yeah, my uh, I think my youngest brother is pretty much a foot taller than I am. So. <laughs> and then the, my middle brother is like somewhere between us. I don't know how tall he is right offhand. I just know my youngest brother is the tallest and I'm the shortest. Yeah. All right. Oh yeah. Good night, Sloppy Malibu. Yeah, I'm trying to night Brian. I'm trying to keep up with the Joe. Oh no. Oh no. Joe can't print because the cloud service is down. That's that's bad. All right. Oops. Did I get something mixed up? LS DOS. Oh, all right, hold on. I've got the thumb drives mixed up. It didn't boot into the operating system I expected it to. There we go. All right. So let me reset. I know it's I can't really show the screen at this angle, but the floppy drives are working. Yep, I just booted into TRS DOS from drive zero. Guess let me let me give it a date. So to make it happy, today is December thirty first of 87 I think that date will and then if I type dir it should give me a directory listing of both disks but most importantly it will access drive one and yes very good. And more importantly, drive one's not doing anything weird. Neither is drive zero. All right.
So I guess I can uh, finish putting this back together. Yay. And then maybe, maybe someday we'll, uh, No, I'm not gonna make that joke. There's uh, probably selling enough blue scuzzies it is, as it is to, to think about the prospect of TRS-80 blue scuzzy. All right. There's probably like, there already is one. It's called the, uh, the Fred. Boom, problem solved. So I do not have a Fred. I don't know if I'll get, I mean, maybe someday I'll get one because they do seem pretty neat, but I don't have a Fred. That's basically the like hard drive emulator for the TRS-80 models. Actually, I think it works with pretty much all of them. Oh, 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 good, Joe. Okay, so Joe, while Joe's can't print to his bamboo because the cloud service is down, I think luckily that's just the, he can't print through the cloud service because the cloud service is down, but he can uh, go, he can uh, take a SD card to it, so that's good. Oh, Joe has a Fred and it doesn't work. That's, uh... That's odd. Or at least I'll put it this way, it doesn't match the uh, the Fred enthusiast's suggestions to just buy off the Fred, it'll solve all your problems. What was the, the one annoying thing I think I asked a TRS-80 group on Facebook, what software should I run? And I think I had several people tell me, well, get a Fred. Okay, but that didn't answer my question of what software should I try on this TRS-80 Model 4P? <laughs> oh. So, uh, yeah. Um, it's great and all suggesting that I run the software from a Fred, but yeah. I, I never did really get a good answer on what software I should try running on this that was like platform, uh, like the must try software. Either that or everyone was afraid to admit that, yeah, the TRS-80 was good for uh, running uh, accounting software and <laughs> no one wanted to admit that. I know there has to be some some software, even if maybe, I'll try running CPM on this one day, because I think it can run CPM. And actually, I should be able to easily run it because of the Gotex. Uh, I don't know if I'm on the Tandy Discord, I'll have to check. I'm on a lot of Discord, I'm on so many Discords seemingly that I, uh, I've actually uh, got two of them mixed up the other day because their icons were even too similar. It was actually kind of embarrassing. Um, but yeah, I'll check and see if I'm on the Tandy Discord. Because I still would like to know what software people remember running on these. Like games or... Educational software. Banner printer. Yeah, Jeremy, the Fred is like the, um, supposed to be the greatest thing since sliced bread. It plugs into the, I think the, I guess it's the expansion port. It basically looks like the hard drive to the computer. But I think it, um, I think it's actually uses a fat formatted SD card or something like that. 
So you can easily copy programs to it from your computer. Or actually, it might actually look like the network adapter. Ah, text adventure games. Yeah, I'll have to check out some of those. If you've got like one, a specific one you remember running. Zork, okay. Yes, I'll have to check out Zork. I mean, I have no problems maybe someday getting a Fred, but it's kind of the, um, kind of the, that didn't answer my question exactly of what should I run, but thanks for the recommendation to run them from a Fred. Uh, I don't know, maybe the Fred had, comes with the preloaded software on it and but still I'm like I, I, I think I specifically asked people what software do you remember running on these at, uh, back in the day and so it, it's And I know they weren't using Fred's back in the day. But anyways, so yeah, I'll, ch I'll check out Zork. That's a good suggestion. But at least I'll be able to take this to work for Engineers Week. And maybe I'll find Zork. Yeah, okay, it does come with software. So I mean, yeah, I guess they were, it's not like they were completely dodging my question, but they were because I clearly remember asking what software do you remember running on these back in the day? So, I mean, I, I totally understand is like, hey, you want to run it from this, but it didn't answer my question. Because this is actually the first TRS-80 I've ever owned. And actually the first TRS-80 I've ever used is this one right here. And it was a channel surprise from Joe's Computer Museum. So, and actually, <laughs> the idea to just replace the floppy drives with Gotex was also Joe's idea. So, Anyways, all right, I got the, uh... yeah, I would like to find an archive of software that you could just copy to GoTech as well, but it seems like some of the software for the TRS-80, at least on the, the easier to find sites, they, they don't have disk images, they just have, um, Um, the, the program files. All right. These are just a bit fiddly to put back together because of the way the, the keyboard attaches. All right. All right, so. Let's see here. There we go. So to put it back together, you just have to get the keyboard cable positioned just right so that the case will close. And then so put the 
handle. Well, you know, I don't have to put the handle on. Let me just go ahead and screw the side on so I can turn this upright and check to make sure that I got the keyboard in right. So let me just put enough screws in to hold the case on to, to turn it right side up. All right, so, all right, I got the keyboard. It looks like I did get the keyboard in uh, correctly. So, so that I'm not fighting the keyboard. And hi, Jay, welcome. I, there we go, put the lid on. Yep, I don't have a cocoa. Maybe someday I'll get a cocoa. But that will be after March and Tosh because I've got a number of things I would like to do for March and Tosh. Some of which would probably be no surprise. I would like to get one of my SEs working correctly. I have ordered some parts to help with that. I've got the LC-475 that I bought from Japan because of pricing that it's sadly cheaper to buy a LC-475 from Japan than it is from the States. And weirdly enough, I didn't even have to use the Yahoo auctions or whatever the the uh, the tool is that lets you buy things from Yahoo Auctions Japan because in this case it was someone in Japan selling it on eBay, so I didn't even have to change platforms. But yet I paid like seventy five dollars, that included shipping, and I got an LC four seventy five from Japan. And it seems like if they're in the U S. they go for one fifty in the same condition, which is just ridiculous. So I've got that. I've um, that will be some scripted videos on that because I've actually already done all the work on it. Uh, well, ex no, yeah, except for the case. I may, I may do a live stream of trying to get it into a new case. I've got uh, the LC3 that I recently got and recapped. I probably will do a video on that. I bought another LC3, so yeah, I'll get a, a cocoa for Septandy. So I got a um another bought another LC3. So why? Well, I don't know. I did have this crazy thought because I know I'm coming up on 256 subscribers, but I don't know that I want to give an LC3 away for that level because that's kind of an expensive prize for 256 subscribers, but I may, uh, I, may, I, I may give it away at some point. I'll just put it that way. It may not be 256 subscribers. I, haven't, I have a thought on what I'll give away for that, but I may, I, I may give away one of the LC3s at a higher subscriber level. Maybe you want to hit 1,000 subscribers, or maybe 512 subscribers, but yeah. So, and then, um, and then maybe, maybe, maybe I might get my 2CI back so that I can finally do what I wanted to do with it for my domain anniversary. So, I got my, uh, the TRS-80s back together. I guess let me power it up. I wish I had a camera view. Let me see if there's anything I can set this on so I can at least 
So you can at least see what's on the screen and I still keep it plugged in. Mm, the Dremel box. A thousand subscriber. Yeah, okay. So maybe the LC3 will be my thousand subscriber giveaway. So there we go. If you want to see me give away an LC3, and actually if it's a thousand subscribers, I might even be able to, to somehow finagle some ability to ship it internationally. That's kind of one reason I don't want to give it away at 256 subscribers because I can't, I, I can't ship something like that internationally for 256 subscribers. The, the numbers just don't work out. But a thousand subscribers, I think I could do it. So there we go. So if you want to see me give away an LC3 sooner rather than later, then you need to invite your friends to subscribe to my channel if they like retro computers and they like all retro computers equally then they should enjoy my channel because looky here I've got a TRS-80 tonight I'll be working on PCs tomorrow and soon enough I'll be working on Macs and I guess I'll turn that light off so you can see the contrast just a little better but there we go, TRS-DOS. And if I do a directory, there it's doing a directory of just, uh, that's disk zero. And then as soon as it does the directory on that, it should switch over to drive disk one. And there we go, look at that. That is beautiful. Yeah, it looks like it's working just as intended. And then the cool thing is if I reset it, then I, I don't even have to enter the date when it comes back up. Also, I think the TRS-DOS, I, I think that's really cool that the Tandy Corporation logo on the screen, that they were able to print that with text characters. I think that's pretty cool. So There we go. I, uh, that, that's really what I needed to do. So, all right. I do have it in a position that I d did not want to leave it in for long because I, I did not want to leave it sitting on the, my Dremel box long enough for the 8-bit guy to think that Dremels are an appropriate TRS-80 repair method. But at least now I've got it in... Uh, working shape again and it's back together. So now when I get a chance to do the B-roll for that, then I, uh, I should be able to do it. Now granted, I, uh, I, I want to do a, an, an RGB to HDMI mod on the, that computer so I can do a better video capture, but that wasn't part of the, uh, um, the video I'm working on. So, all right. So actually, um, since this isn't my mainstream for the week, I really had just intended to get the GoTex working and then call it a day because I'll, I do have to uh, get up earlier than usual so I can drop my car off tomorrow. It is overdue for an oil change and it is due for state inspection and I'm having both done at the same time so I'm not severely overdue for the oil change but um, let's just say that when I met my parents this past weekend I, I really didn't want to put those miles on the car because that, that's what pushed me to overdue <laughs> Because I was like, I had just enough uh, miles left that I would was going to make it to the oil change date just in the nick of time if I'd been able to schedule it for when I wanted to. But the place I wanted to go to is doing construction, and it seems like they have more limited appointments than they used to, whatever. Okay, so anyways, that I, this tonight's stream was to just get the TRS-80 working again. 
that's all I intended to do tonight. I wasn't going to run actually much past 1130. I didn't think I would need it. So this was like a focused midweek. I'm glad you all could join me to keep me company while I work on it. Because, I mean, I could have probably finished that up in 30 minutes. But I was like, well, at least I'll stream it. I'll have company. You can kind of get a, a sense for, well, here's, here's what I was facing. So, but I'll at least uh, make sure there's no questions in the chat. Just catch up one final time. Um, let's see here. Oh, Joe, don't worry about complaining. You're, you're, um, you're cool. Uh, you're, you're just pointing out one of the drawbacks of a cloud-based 3D printer is that when their cloud service goes down, that it's not as easy to print to it. But at least your bamboo has the option for an SD card print method. So it's at least not like some cloud devices that when the cloud goes down, they're bricks. So yeah, um, Jeremy, I'll, I'll have to keep an eye out for a Coco 2 or a Coco 3 for Septandy. That sounds pretty cool. Or if anyone has one they'd like to send to the channel, just reach out to me. I'm not opposed to a channel surprise. So let's see here. Yep, um, that TRS-80 can actually run CPM, and I probably will go find the disk images for it, because I would like to see it run CPM. That'd be pretty cool. I, I don't have any other computers that can run CPM, although I would like a Z80 card for my Apple IIe, because I think I'd like to run CPM on it, too. So, oh, and you're right, Jeremy. It, you're right. It would be 1,024 subs. So, yes. Uh, 256 subscribers. I, I need to check with someone to make sure that what I want to do isn't going to violate the license term. So, um, I will make an announcement as soon as I can double check that because, uh, yeah, otherwise I'll do something different. Or in other words, I might be able to give more away if I can do what I want to do versus if I do what I don't want to have to do. So, and I, I don't like calling them trash 80s. I mean, all, all the computers back then had their pluses and their minuses and yeah, I mean, some people called those trash 80s, but then, then again, there were people that trashed the apples and the com. Well, okay, it was kind of hard to trash the Commodores. They really had great graphics and sound for the time. Although kind of later when they were out and uh, like feeling stale because 16 bits were all the rage, yeah, maybe so. But yeah, kind of hard to trash the Commodores because they were, they had the good graphics and the good sound. They, they were kind of the computer that even the Apple fans really secretly wanted. And yeah, I just said that. And yes, if that causes channel engagement, then fine. Yeah, leave comments if you disagree with that. That's channel engagement. <laughs> uh, let's see here. Oh, um... Yeah, um, no state vehicle safety inspection in Arkansas. Well, in Virginia, uh, there is one every year, although I sure thought the, the General Assembly passed a law for every two years, but I could be imagining things. For all I know, they passed a law that's every six months. No, it, they didn't do that. <laughs> I don't, I, yeah, no one would reelect any of them if they did that. <laughs> Uh, one thing that's dumb about Virginia, they require a working heater to pass inspection. All right, Jeremy, after that snowstorm, the back, uh, I think it was sometime last year that stranded all those motorists on I-95 for 30 hours. I don't know that that was necessarily quite as dumb of a requirement. Uh, granted, I think people ran out of gas, but still, um, can get downright cold in Virginia. <laughs> so, I mean, yeah, maybe that it's required to pass inspection, but it can get kind of cold in Virginia. I'm sure those people that got stuck on I-95 probably appreciate 
appreciated having working heaters. So, like, yeah, okay, in the middle of the summer, though, yeah, that's a dumb requirement. But in the winter, yeah, it's kind of necessary. So, anyways. Ah, yes, in Maryland, yes. Our northern neighbor, Maryland. Vehicles get inspected when you buy it and not again until you sell it. Well, yeah. I I'm hoping the general... S I, I would be totally fine with a two-year inspection period. Because, quite honestly, I... I mean, eh, one year's two years, whatever. I don't know. Maybe, maybe it's kind of one of those things that's... I'm not going to comment on whether it's right or wrong to have inspections on cars to, as a requirement to drive them because I have seen cars where it seems like they, um, they somehow got inspected and yet there were serious problems with them. But I don't know. I, I really don't know where I fall on the whole inspection thing because... The thing is, I think there are places that I know that other people knows, and I know that they're there, I just haven't looked for them, that they will inspect the, in, inspect the car and put a sticker on it. And I think about all they do is, uh, is this the car? Check, it is a car. All right, inspection sticker. <laughs> it is a car. Uh, oh, uh, it, it's a truck. The registration says it's a truck. This is a truck. Check. All right, inspection sticker. <laughs> ah, the registration says this is a car. Well, that looks like a bicycle, but it's got the right license plate on it. Check. Inspection sticker. <laughs> I mean, we all know they're out there. <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, all right. Yeah, more, more comment engagement. Yeah. If you really feel strongly about state inspections, you can leave comments, but uh, <laughs> um, I don't know. I'm, I'm kind of torn because on the one hand, it, it seems intrusive for the government to do it. But on the other hand, I mean, I've seen cars driving that I take one look at them and I wonder how they passed inspection. And some of them, I just want to get away from the vehicle. So... <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, now Eric, that that would be something that I uh, you get a fix it ticket, and I think in Virginia that's one of the things that if you get a ticket for unsafe uh, operation and and it, it's probably judge's discretion, but I think they can dismiss the charge if you come and prove that you had the whatever unsafe equipment fixed. I think the judges do have the discretion of doing that. And maybe that would be the, the solution is the, the, um, you give people the chance to fix it and maybe uh, get away with the inspection or make it a, I don't know. I, I kind of like that Maryland system. That seems appealing. You, you get it inspected when you, you buy it. Kind of, I guess in a way lets you know that you're buying a car that meets the minimum safety requirements, but then you're responsible for keeping upkeep, and you get a ticket if it's found to not have the safety equipment, but as long as you're not habitually doing it, you're given the chance to fix it. Because sometimes you don't know something's not safe. I mean, if one of my headlights went out, I, I won't necessarily know it's out unless I happen to pull up behind a vehicle and notice I don't see a reflection or quite possibly I get pulled over because the cop sees it first. But that's kind of the case where I'm not like habitually running with headlights out and I genuinely want to fix it. So, I mean, I, I see in that case, definitely let let the person fix it. You know, I guess I got to go before someone to show that, well, here's here's the receipt for advance auto. I bought the light bulb. You walk outside and turn the headlights on, see that I've got it fixed. And, but yeah. <laughs> All right. Yeah, I think I've started an argument for Commodore 64s too. So, yeah. <laughs> oh, Eric say he got to fix a ticket once and they junked the car as a solution. Well, um, <laughs> officer tried to argue it, but the judge said it's off the road and dismissed it. Yeah, exactly. 
Uh, I, uh, yeah, uh, I think I would agree with that. If you get a fix it ticket and you realize that the, the car is beyond hope and your, your fix is to junk it, then yeah, I, I totally would agree that that should be a valid, I fixed it, it's off the road, it's no longer drivable. Here, here's, here's my registration, here's the license plate, I'm turning them in, I am taking this car off the road. Um, turn the registration and plates in so that if it's caught on the road now, not only is it not working, but it also has no plates on it. <laughs> so it's now double illegal, but yeah. And then judge says, well, fine, dismissed, you fixed it, it's off the road. So, but yeah. Ah, yes, the, the fun with, uh, Fun with driving laws. But anyways, bringing it back to computers. Tomorrow, I have, I guess to tease it one last time, I have, I got, oh, I'm on the wrong cam. So I've got one video card. I've got two video cards. I've got three video cards. I've got four video cards. They're all Trident 8900D based video cards. I think one's the, the D, uh, 8900D and three are the 8900D-R, which I think just basically means the ROM is built into the graphics chip. So two of them came from an eBay auction as untested for parts. I paid like 13 bucks plus a few dollars shipping, which I thought, ah, I'll try to fix them. Uh, one was I bought it off eBay as working. It didn't work when I got it. eBay seller refunded. And one was I bought it off eBay and it started failing outside the return period. So, so four cards. And then I've got the one I bought from Canada that seems to be having a little bit of a problem. So actually I'll have five cards because I'll pull it out of the computer, bring it down here and see if I can see anything obvious wrong with it. Maybe it just needs recapped because it is kind of minor, the screen issues. So I think I'll have five video cards. I want to see if I can get, uh, I'd like to get at least two of them working. So that I have one for the Emerson 386 and one for my 386 DX 40. So that's the goal. Try to get two working or at least have fun doing it. And that'll be tomorrow night, starting at 8 p.m. Eastern. I'll probably be streaming a while, so don't worry if you uh, can't make it for the whole stream. We'll have fun. And then Monday, starting at 1 p.m. Eastern, I'm having my sync and, or what do I call it? Computer and Syncathon, I think. So I'll probably be have a variety of things I'll do. I'll probably stream for, I don't know, six to eight hours at least. That'll be kind of a long stream. I'll probably have to take some breaks in the middle because I do know I've got a package coming that needs a signature, so I'll have a couple interruptions, but I, I decided to at least start it after lunch so that I don't have to take a lunch break. So, But that'll be Monday starting at uh, 1 p.m. Eastern, so check that out as you can. And with that, I will... I think I'm going to call this stream now so I can go ahead and get to bed, make sure I do get my car in at my appointed service time because they are currently doing construction and they clearly said when I scheduled my appointment, we have limited waiting area. So I took that to mean you probably don't want me to show up well before my appointment time and you're hoping that I take the shuttle as soon as it's available. So I do need to make sure I'm there on time and not too early, but definitely not too late because message received, you don't have much waiting area and I don't know what the weather's going to be tomorrow morning, but I sure don't want to be standing outside in the rain or cold. Oh wait, no, tomorrow's going to be unseasonably warm. Okay, I don't want to be standing outside in the unseasonable warmth uh, right beside your massive construction of oh, disaster. I sure hope your renovations are really nice because 
I have no idea what they're doing to their building. All I know is that last time I drove by them, uh, which was actually a couple days ago, it looked so bad in their parking lot. I actually called them this afternoon just to ask, okay, where is the service reception area? Because <laughs> I did not want to be trying to navigate the chopped up parking lot to find the service area. And it is exactly where, okay. The good thing is, it's not where I hoped it wasn't, but yeah, they have three trailers in their parking lot and one of them is the service reception area. So I sure hope they get the renovations done soon because, uh, oh, I kind of feel bad for them because those trailers are just not the greatest thing in the world. But anyways, yes. Hope to see you all tomorrow evening, starting at 8 Eastern. And with that, have a great rest of your day, and we'll see you next time. Take care. Computerized Start is brought to you by my awesome patrons on Patreon. And by your tips and memberships on Coffee. These and other channel supporters make my live streams possible. You too can become a channel supporter with tiers starting at just $1. Don't forget to smash that like button. And if you've liked what you've seen, subscribe and turn on notifications so that you don't miss the next video or live stream. And as always, thank you for all your support. I hope to see you next time. And until then, take care.